Can people, uh, can people online hear me? Okay, thank you. So welcome everyone. Um, I think people online, you cannot see me, but that's because I have turned the camera to our guest speakers. So I'm gonna do my little introduction and then we'll, we'll begin the process. So don't feel that it's strange that you can't see me. That is sort of deliberate. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Je m'appelle Natasha Barthes et je suis professeure à la Faculté de droit. J'aimerais vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cet événement de la série de conférences Shirley Greenberg. Avant de commencer, je veux reconnaître que l'Université d'Ottawa est située sur le territoire non cédé des peuples algonquins. Many of us are uninvited guests in Algonquin territory. And I am grateful to be living and working in this beautiful region. And I thank the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. And I say this land acknowledgement not because I'm required to or out of a mechanical acknowledgement or unthinking routine, but because I see it as a small step toward our ongoing efforts at reconciliation with indigenous peoples. Reconciliation is, of course, something we do. The word as a verb necessitates a commitment to developing the law in a manner that decolonizes it. And I say the land acknowledgement in the hope that we will take seriously its many implications in each of our lives. So I'm so pleased today to introduce our special guests, these women are superstars at our faculty and in our legal community, and they are very busy. You have no idea the challenges associated with getting them in one room. I'm going to introduce them briefly, but please know that I won't be able to do their formidable biographies and experiences justice. Then I'm gonna ask each of them to present for about 10 minutes on their work that lies at the intersection of art and law. And this will be followed by some questions that I'll ask them, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from all of you. And for those of you who are in the room, you will have noticed that there is food here. Please feel free at any time to uh, help yourself to the food that is here. Okay, I'll start with uh, Professor Suzanne Bouclin. Professor Bouclin teaches in the areas of social justice, human rights, and conflict resolution. She is highly regarded for her work in furthering social justice for marginalized people. She was from 2016 to 2018 appointed to the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. In 2014, she relaunched the Ticket Defense Program, which is a free mobile legal clinic providing legal services to homeless people in Ottawa. Dr. Bouclin is the recipient of the University of Ottawa's prestigious Young Researcher of the Year Award and an outgoing member of the Young Global Academy. Her 2021 monograph, Women, Film and Law, explores how fictional representations of women's incarceration can illuminate the marginalization, social exclusion and oppression experienced by criminalized women. This book was the co-winner of the Greenberg Prize for Feminist Research this year, and she's gonna be discussing this amazing research today. Then we'll have Professor Jamie Liu, who is an expert in immigration, refugee and citizenship law. And her research examines, among other things, the legal barriers for stateless persons to obtain citizenship and the gendered implications of Canadian law on migrants. She is on the brink of publishing her new book on statelessness and the law. 
Professor Liu has acted for an intervener at the Supreme Court of Canada in a number of cases and has been cited by the Supreme Court in Kanthasami and Canada. She has created and hosts the renowned podcast, Migration Conversations. And finally, and what I hope she'll talk about today is her debut novel, Dandelion, which extends her work on statelessness beyond the academic arena. And incredibly, for a first novel, Dandelion made the 2023 Canada Reads long list. Yay. And finally, Professor M.A. Kraft is an award-winning teacher and researcher recognized internationally as a leader in the area of Indigenous laws, treaties, and water. She is an Anishinaabe Métis lawyer from Treaty 1 territory in Manitoba. She holds a university chair on Indigenous governance in relationship with land and water. Professor Kraft prioritizes Indigenous-led and interdisciplinary research, including through visual arts and film, and she co-leads a series of major research grants on decolonizing water governance and works with many Indigenous nations and communities on Indigenous relationships with and responsibilities to NIBI, or water. She has written a critically acclaimed children's book, Treaty Words, and I hope that she'll talk about that today, in which she explains treaty philosophy and relationships. So what an amazing group of women you are. We are so very, very lucky to have you with us today and as part of our community here at the University of Ottawa. So let me turn it over to Professor Bouclin. Are you happy to speak from where you are or would you like to, yeah? Okay, can you hear me okay? I'm gonna give you this just in case. Okay. I'm not great with the mic. I didn't turn it on yet. Oh, right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, we were just saying, Professor Bax, how uh, it's kind of ironic that you're not here <laughs> because you are the person that I associate the most with law and art. That's uh, why I get to moderate. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, Angela Davis said a long time ago that people who occupy spaces of privilege tend to experience the prison, the carceral system in a mediated manner um, through television uh, and cinema in particular. And we're seeing more of that engagement with some thoughtful and interesting shows like Orange is the New Black, um, Wentworth, Bad Girls and Unité Neuf, if you're francophone like me. Um, and with the growing popularity and accessibility of these texts um, is coming a new conversation about whether or not they are advancing or hindering uh, prison abolitionist uh, conversations and discourses. So for over a decade, I have looked at women in prison movies so long before Orange is the New Black existed. And I have argued for a long time that they do actually advance feminist jurisprudence. Um, is it okay, the sound? Okay. Uh, and I, I say that by looking at them as a genre on their own. So women in prison movies as an actual genre. I did that by watching over 400 films and categorizing them along themes, expectations from audiences, um, codes, conventions. So genre is a form of law. It's a way that we organize thinking. It's a way of excluding and including certain texts. Um, and so the cinematic genre of women in prison movies has some features that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and I'll get to those in a moment. Um, well, actually I can get to them now. So basically the theme that we see in women in prison movies most often is one of repression and resistance. There are stock characters, so characters that we see in again and again. One of them is uh, a butch feminist, uh, butch feminist lesbian. Another is a, um, a matron who may or may not be repressive or may be advancing uh, the protagonist's uh, empowerment. But essentially they follow these, these beats. There's historically and until recently, a, the protagonist was a white middle-class, normatively attractive, naive woman who was either factually or morally innocent. So factually innocent in the sense that she was either framed by her unsavory boyfriend or um, was uh, unaware that she was actually committing a crime uh, and uh, is sent to prison for an inordinate amount of time considering the crime that she is accused of committing, where she 
will discover that she's expecting company, that she's pregnant, that they're pregnant, and or someone close to her is pregnant. Um, for a bunch of reasons, she'll become jaded, usually because she will lose the child to the state. The state will come and scoop up the child, uh, or she'll have uh, they'll miscarry, or uh, someone close to her will take their own life. And then she's transformed by that experience. So if you're following a more mainstream status quo script, and there are films that do this, she's transformed through the love of a good man. So a warden, a priest, a lawyer who's convinced of her innocence or a journalist. And so at the end of the film, she's marriageable, like she's ready to go. <laughs> However, after watching 400 and more of these films, I found that there was actually a less mainstream, but much more powerful um, flow and narrative in these other films where not only does she is she transformed, but she's transformed in ways that um, certainly do not lead her uh, to what we would consider the good life with uh, a heterosexual union. Uh, so, oh, and I should mention, she takes multiple showers along the way. So like whatever film you're watching, and this is like from the 1920s on, like in the 1920s, they show just like a pan of feet, but you know, those ladies are taking showers. And then there are other iterations that we can talk about. Um, so the movies that I look at are proto, pro, or explicitly feminist films uh, that shed light on the regulation, the mar marginalization, and oppression experienced by criminalized women. They're bold, sometimes ironic portrayals of strong and beautiful women, flawed and complex women, women who engage in disruptive strategies, assert selfhood and agency as they navigate conditions of constraint and inequality. These films leave their viewers feeling empathetic towards the women who are warehoused in prison, uh, troubled about the crimes for which they have been charged, and unsettled about the very existence of prisons at all. Um, so two notes about how, like I had to choose the films that I was gonna talk about from this variety of films. And I limited the genre to 400 by doing two things, two maneuvers. One is that I only talk about films that are produced in the US or tell stories about US prisons. And I do that because the US leads the incarceration rates worldwide. There has been a 700% increase in female incarceration over the last 15 years. Um, and of course, women who are warehoused in prison are members of racial, cultural, and ethnic minorities, particularly in the states, indigenous women, Latinas, and black women from neighborhoods that are over-policed and under-protected. They have pre-existing histories of trauma. They've been through foster care, or they've had their children ripped from their families. Uh, they have navigated mental health issues before their incarceration. They're poor. Uh, and they are incarcerated for engaging in drug-related or other minor offenses that are committed or engaged in out of necessity, out of desperation, or out of pragmatism. The other thing I do is I only look at fictional films. And um, my colleagues do, uh, I've got, we've got a mix here, which is fascinating. And I will just say that I look at fictional films because they allow us to imagine another possible future um, rather than telling us what it is currently. It's a fictional universe, so it creates a psychic space where we can imagine something differently. Different, pardon. So really quickly, the five movies and the one TV show that I look at are the following. I'll give you a very brief synopsis. If there's anything that you're interested in, we can talk about it during questions. So Ann Vickers was produced in 1933 before the production code came into play. And I can explain what that is if you're not aware of it. And it follows an educated middle-class white protagonist who is a warden. It is the only film that I look at that follows the warden because she herself has had a clandestine abortion at a time when it was illegal. And so throughout the film, she is constantly confronted with the reality that but for <clears throat> her race and class privilege, she herself would be one of her charges. And fun fact, that movie ends with her in a satisfying polygamous union totally shattering heteronormative structures at the time. It's really interesting, hard to find, 1933 and Vickers. Second one is Caged, 1950. It is the quintessential women in prison movie. You've likely heard about it. Orange is the New Black consistently cites it um, in various ways. And that film basically follows, uh, again, 
uh, white working class protagonist who essentially is forced into making life choices that leave her with little other op um, option than to engage in sex work in order to survive. It's also widely embraced as a quintessentially queer film uh, because, and I'm quoting a line from the film, it is where women find appropriate and meaningful outlets for their affection. Aged Heat is one of the babes behind bars movies. So these movies are what kind of attracted feminist critique of the genre in and of itself because while this film that I'm talking about does challenge some of the patriarchal structures, they also, like the women in them have to be topless in order to resist the patriarchal structures. <laughs> so it's, they're fascinating. Now, what's interesting about that cycle of films, the exploitation films, is that there are, this is where we see Black protagonists, uh, women who, as radical as it sounds, are not killed by the end of the film at, at a time where if you had a Black protagonist, likely they were going to die. And so this is when Pam Greer gets her, she gets a, a lot of her films at the beginning of her career are women in prison movies, and the fans would have lost their minds if anything happened to her. So we have these strong Black protagonists. Again, complicated texts, but... Um, there are also queer uh, and, and normalized lesbian relationships, interracial lesbian relationships. And if you think back at during the production code, miscegenation was uh, not allowed in films. Uh, and then the next two films that I look at together are from 2001 and 2003. Both are produced by Black uh, independent filmmakers. One is the only film that I've seen until Orange is New Black that is telling a story explicitly from a queer Black standpoint. Uh, and, the, uh, and it explores the relationship between daughters and mothers in, uh, through incarceration. And the other is um, the first film that explicitly calls out the prison industrial complex. And similarly, we've got Black, intelligent, strong Black characters who are engaging in justifiable violence, according to the film's narrative. And then, of course, Orange is the New Black, which I hated, actually, for the first two seasons. And it bugged me that everybody was talking about it because I was like, no, this is my thing that I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, but then I really fell in love with it, mostly because of Tasty, because uh, she's amazing. Her character is really interesting and complex. Um, and Orange as the new black connects with the promise of social problem films. So the films from like the thirties and the fifties that are engaging head on with the criminalization of women, but also plays with the campiness, the funness of the 1970s exploitation films in ways that offer us intelligent and human humanizing stories. Uh, and also really importantly expands the palette of women that we see on TV. So we've got, you know, black trans women, we've got um, non-binary characters, Latinx characters, women with a range of faiths and uh, women navigating mental illness. So in conclusion, these movies reveal that the prison is archaic, violent, totalizing, um, and it sets women to fail. Uh, even when they are released. They are part of, these films, I believe, are part of an arsenal to be used and deployed by prison abolitionists, by critical race theorists, and by anti-carceral feminists. They're funny, they're campy, they're thought-provoking, uh, and very, very entertaining. And most importantly, they feature entirely or almost entirely female casts, women in all their diversity, uh, who are simultaneously vulnerable and powerful, but their vulnerability is not reified as victimhood, and importantly, their power is not reified as un unadulterated emancipation. Thank I, you. Yeah. Did I go first? Sorry. No, you were first. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so honored to be here with such amazing colleagues and friends um, to talk about our, some of our passion work. Um, before I dive into it, I just wanted to acknowledge that this uh, book was written on various Indigenous lands, and I want to, you know, pay homage to that. The lands of the Orang Asli in Peninsula Malaysia, Orang Ulu in Sarawak, Malaysia, uh, obviously the Anishinaabe and unceded Algonquin territory here in Ottawa, and Treaty 7, where a lot of my family's from in southern Alberta. Um, I also want to um, describe how I look to those that might be visually impaired. I'm wearing a knitted white vest. I really love knitting. So I'm wearing that just to kind of honor the other kinds of art that we might do. Um, a dress that has like wavy lines that's from a Canadian um, 
designer from a store, local store here in Ottawa called Flock. And I'm wearing a pair of black tall boots that I bought of the first expensive thing I bought while I was articling. And if you're asking, how is it that I still own it? It's because when I first bought them, they were so much to me because at the time I couldn't fathom spending that much money on a pair of boots that I didn't wear them that much, even though I should have while I was articling. And 15 years later, they're still wearable. So there you go. Um, I'm really to be talking about my debut novel, Dandelion, today. Um, it is something that was unexpected, a surprise. Um, it wasn't something I intended to do initially. At the time I was on sabbatical, um, something that is a huge privilege for a professor like myself. And I was really burnt out from teaching, from researching, but most of all from practicing law, which I, I was doing at the time, doing first line uh, work in immigration law. And um, I, I, I was doing research on statelessness and talking to a lot of people, and in particular, stateless people um, about their journeys to try to get citizenship, the trials and tribulations and challenges and uh, getting applications in and the disappointment and not getting the results that they could get. And, uh, you know, a lot of the narratives and the stories I heard were things that I couldn't quite fit into a typical uh, legal argument or a legal uh, scholarship piece of scholarship, you know, and I tried really hard to kind of weave things in and um, but felt really constrained by the writing barriers and the expectations with regards to what kinds of things we can produce in our work. Um, and so I kind of just took some time to kind of journal and it started out that way journaling. Um, so I went to a coffee shop every day for three months and and, and thought to myself, you know, I've always wanted to write a novel, but I didn't think it was something that uh, I had time to do in the past or something, you know, that I thought I could do. And I said, well, this is the only time that I will have kind of, uh, you know, uh, unrestricted time to, to try to explore. And so for every day for at least an hour and sometimes up to three or four hours, I would sit and just write. Um, and it was a coffee shop that didn't have any internet access. So it really kept my focus at the time. Um, and three months later, I had a very, very, very rough draft, a novel. Um, uh, and I can say that it was one of the most cathartic things that I've ever experienced. Um, for those of you who are thinking about, you know, um, uh, the ways in which you can develop self-care practices in trauma-informed ways, especially if you're working in really difficult uh, legal um, issues and hearing difficult stories. One of the things that I found very cathartic about this was just writing and exploring things through, through that process. And a lot of it's discarded. A lot of it I haven't used in this product, but I can say it was um, very cathartic and it allowed me to use things that I had been thinking about that I couldn't articulate in a legal argument or in legal scholarship in, in the ways that I wanted to, to depict them. So, um, this is why this project um, was born. The other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, I had been in conversations with a lot of my colleagues here at UBO especially about narrative writing. And, um, you know, I think one of the things about uh, law schools that we do see a lot of narratives in case law, in the stories that, that judges write in the facts, especially portion of the cases, but they're often missing a lot of really, really, really important details. Um, I was teaching on Monday, or was it last week, uh, the case of Baker, which I think many of you know, you might have learned it in administrative law class, and it's like the case that talks about bias in administrative law or procedural fairness and how the Supreme Court really um, set out the principles with regards to fair process. And, um, you know, I asked the students before I taught that class, you know, uh, what they knew about Josephine Baker. And they all admitted that they didn't know anything about her. Um, and so we had a conversation and, and Constance Backhouse actually has a fabulous chapter that I teach alongside um, this case in talking about who Josephine Baker was, why her race was important, why her gender was important, her socioeconomic positionality, but also her disability, which is still not talked about in a lot of um, scholarship and writing. Um, I say this to you because I think we, even though we're confronted by narratives in all of our legal reading and whatnot, it's very different. And um, and I think it's an art to create narrative. You know, it, part of being a lawyer is sometimes taking your client's story and 
twisting it and recreating it that's in a palatable way to um, decision makers. Um, but I wanted to explore narrative in a different way um, and, and unrestricted from, from those, those barriers and to tell it from the perspective of, of the people that I heard stories from. Um, and I think that one of the challenges of doing this was <laughs> Um, that at the same time I was writing out the legal scholarship piece of my research on stateless persons. So part of that work was to document how people are state become stateless, why they're stateless, what they've done to try to um, resolve that by getting citizenship and why they're being denied. Um, that work was written at the same time as this work and it is only now getting published next February. And in the peer review process, some of the feedback I got was the narrative is quite campy. Um, I don't know why the author delves into her personal connection to statelessness. Full disclosure, one of the reasons why I decided to embark on my research on statelessness is because my father immigrated to Canada as a stateless person, um, that he you know, chose to come to Canada because he basically had no choice. But to try to obtain status anywhere he could. And Canada was the first place that responded. And for you know the academy to tell me <laughs> um, that the narrative is not important, that this aspect of the research is, is problematic or, or um, too personal, really, um, again, ignited for me you know, um, the reason why we should be doing narrative work more, why we should be sharing these kinds of stories more, and why there should be more attention paid to the people and the names on the cases that we read. Um, so it is not, it, it, it's really quite telling to see these kinds of work come to the world and to see the reception. And I have to say that one of the most rewarding things about writing this book is how people have written to me, complete strangers and say, I'd never heard about statelessness before. I didn't know such a thing existed. Um, thanks for telling me about this phenomena. Um, and that above anything else has been the most important aspect of, of doing this kind of work for me. Um, and, and for those of you who are thinking about it, to think about just um, how the reach of our work can be beyond just our writing in, in legal arguments, in legal writing, but to think about creative ways in which we can share our experiences, our knowledge and our insights into what we're seeing in the legal context and how we might want to translate that to um, people so that we influence public discourse around this. Um, so one of the things I also wanted to say that I found it very cathartic as a legal scholar as well to write, um, to have two projects simultaneously <laughs> feeding each other. So the one thing that I found very, very um, enriching for me was how they both fed each other I would spend like you know times editing you know the novel, um, and and think about an image, and then it would inform my legal scholarship. So the book that my academic book, I just signed the book contract yesterday actually, and it's coming out February 2024, and it's titled Ghost Citizens, and that's not an accident. Um, that title Ghost Citizens comes from um, an image that I. country. Um, they have deep links there, whether they've resided there for a long time, they were born there, they have family there. There's a whole host of reasons why they feel connected to that country. But for whatever, whatever reason, that country does not feel the same way and has not conferred citizenship on them. So, you know, this, this term of ghost citizenship kind of um, documents the state ghosting them. So this kind of act on the state of ignoring or denying or gaslighting um, the very identity that people claim as their own. 
the other aspect of ghost citizenship is that states are not only ghosting them, but they're also conferring ghost citizenship on them. What I mean by that is that they consider them foreign. So they, you know, tell that stateless person, no, 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 you're actually a citizen of Thailand. No, you're actually a citizen of China, even though that person might not have been to that country before or have very tenuous links, like their mother may have citizenship to that country. And so that person, without any legal document, legal confirmation or proof that citizenship has in fact been conferred is, you know, being conferred this kind of ghost-like citizenship to basically deny them the status of being stateless and deny them the status of citizenship in that very country. Again, this whole concept came to me because I was just writing an image in, in this book. And I'll, I'll, if you indulge me, I'll read a little bit, a small excerpt from that, if I can find it. So this is a, a small scene um, where the family in the book has gone on a camping trip and um, the narrator of the book is a young girl. She's 11 at the time. Her father was previously stateless um, and her mother came with her father to immigrate to Canada. The father, you know, was embracing Canada, wants to assimilate. Mother feeling a little bit apprehensive about it, not feeling very welcome or or uh, attuned to two things that are happening in Canada. And so they're, you know, um, on this kind of road trip, camping trip, and um, uh, they had just gone on a hike in Waterton Lake in, in, in Alberta, and um, the narrator's father is suggesting other hikes they could do the next day, and the mother's kind of not interested. Um, she says, it's just going to be more of the same. And the narrator says, I thought about mother's superstitious ways. Maybe she felt there was some hung or some wind out there that wasn't right for her. After dinner, I could see mother and father in the distance. Mother was moving her arms wildly and father was looking at his feet. He raised his head, trying to interrupt. I felt my back clench. I hated seeing mother unhappy. The argument ended abruptly when she stormed off into the dark. It was the dark before she returned. She looked like Igui, the hungry ghost who roams the streets like a shadow, her long black hair resting over her shoulders and back, searching for sustenance, but finding out, or finding only what is rotten. When the light revealed it was mother, she was still sullen. We acted as if nothing had happened and crawled into the van. As father snored, mother sat upright, stroking her ankle as if she had tested it too much during the day's hike. I fell asleep watching her knead her foot with a steady force. I kind of took that image of Igui from a very old uh, Chinese folktale that I heard my aunties talk about. And it inspired my thinking around how a lot of statelessness resides in finding a stateless person's mother as a foreigner and therefore casting that kind of ghost-like shadow onto the child. And so that, you know, you can see how just writing that made me think a little bit about the folktales, about ghost-like experiences, about the stories that stateless people told me how they felt like they were living in purgatory, and that led to this kind of ontological term that I crafted in my research called ghost citizens. So anyways, I'm open to questions and yeah, happy to. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's works. Actually, I might try and hold this because I always talk a lot with my hands. Anyway, thank you again for the invitation to participate and to my wonderful colleagues for um, sharing some of their ways of expressing big ideas. And that's the premise of the work that I that I engage in is that art is actually a way of expressing important ideas. Um, they're not the idea, it's not the ideas themselves, but a way of expressing it. They can either be received by someone, uh, distorted by people, which we see all the time in expressions of art, but can serve as a tool to really uh, capture something, an idea that otherwise would be uh, too abstract or to allow us ports of entry into ideas that are abstract or foreign to ourselves in ways that we can find relation to. And that's really the, the crux of this, um, this small book. I always call it the small book, um, treaty words for as long as the rivers flow, because it takes up this idea of for as long as the rivers flow, what does that mean? What does it normatively mean? 
And from a very simplistic perspective, one might think that it means forever, for as long as something happens, which is a, a depiction of foreverness. But it actually has a, a stronger resonance and, and meaning in terms of understanding Indigenous treaty making. It, it reflects uh, core values of treaty making that we often kind of list, but don't profoundly understand. Um, and those are reciprocity, renewal, uh, respect, and um, uh, did I say renewal? Reciprocity, respect, and renewal. And so this was a point of entry for me to try and explain treaty philosophy in ways that would be accessible to people that hadn't been learning this or observing it on land and to bring uh, someone into a physical environment, a uh, land-based environment, uh, and allowing for people to relate to that land-based environment in observing the relationships that are a reflection of how ultimately treaties were made with the Crown uh, at the time of settler presence in the territory. The premise of the book, too, is that these treaties have been happening on the land without Indigenous people for a very long time. So the book is really a resistance to a dominant narrative that Indigenous people were unsophisticated, uncultured, unorganized, and conquered um, in, in treaty making. It points to the treaties that were made even before Indigenous people were here, when it was the rest of creation that was making arrangements and agreements uh, amongst themselves in the agreements that we have made with different uh, nations, at, for example, animal nations, the arrangements then that were made within Indigenous societies and amongst them that reflect this practice, a long-standing practice of treaty making, that then is articulated in uh, the treaty making with the Crown. Um, so what you're going to get from an English written version of a treaty with Indigenous people is not even close to a reflection of a what was negotiated on the ground, but also not a reflection of this rich history of diplomacy and governance that had been developed over millennia. That's actually taking its cues from the land and those other beings that have something really important to tell us about how to live well, because we're seeing right now an environmental chaos that we're trying to respond to that is taking place kind of because of us, but also despite us as humans. So I didn't write that in the book. <laughs> the book is a story about a young girl and her grandfather. And the reason this ended up as a, as a small book, as a children's book, um, is really um, a question of coincidence. Uh, the story itself comes from an experience sitting on the banks of the river with an elder and having this treaty relationship shown uh, with melting crystals of ice and in, an, in one day sitting with that elder by the water, the entire landscape changed. And what we saw was this renewal and reciprocity taking place before our eyes. And so I knew that that story needed to be told. And I knew that story was a reflection of how I understood treaty making and treaty relationships. And it kind of simmered. It sat, it was told many times. Uh, my nieces and nephews are my prime, uh, <laughs> they're my big helpers. They get to hear all these stories and told orally. And then I sat down and wrote it in one shot, one uh, short story that ended up being in a literary journal. It was my first work of quote unquote fiction. I felt really uncomfortable about it. Talked to some mentors who were amazing fiction writers. And um, and then it took on a life of its own, and it was picked up by a children's book press that said, we really want to transform this into a children's book. Um, and, and I said, I'm not a children's book writer. And they said, well, let us help you. Uh, we'll just take the text as it is and transform it and work with Luke Swinson, who's an, an amazing Anishinaabe artist, in bringing life to it through images, which was very appealing to me because there are two... Indigenous methodologies that are essential to communicating big ideas. The first is orality, and the second is imagery. And so, in large part, you're not going to see anything historic in Anishinaabe that's written out in uh, alphabetical text. There 
images. They're stories that are transmitted through generations, values and teachings and language that are shared um, and have a very long, rich history and life in and of themselves. What's also said about orality and storytelling, as well as images, is that they have a spirit and life of their own. And I think almost anyone who is engaged in art would probably say the same thing about most forms of art as they do have some kind of spirit. They engage you in thinking, in seeing something uh, based on your experience of seeing it, interacting with it. Have any of you seen something more than once but had a completely different impression of it each time you've seen it or at different occasions? That's because we're in interaction with that image, that idea, um, that song. So things can be experienced differently. And I think that's the importance of that Indigenous methodology as well is engaging the person who's receiving in uh, an act of interpretive exercise. And so there's work that needs to be done in reading the little book. You can't just kind of read it and say, I'm done. I understand everything. Uh, I always ask people to go uh, mirror this relationship, go sit by the water, try and understand these different moments in time where you can see that renewal that's taking place on the land and see if you see it differently than this main character. Um, although the main character is designed um, to be everybody, for everyone to see themselves in this character. When the book was launched, it was during the pandemic, and um, we did an online launch, which is kind of boring. Um, <laughs> so I asked my niece Lucy if she would actually be the reader of part of the, the book. And she said, yeah, sure. And she practiced, and she'd read it so many times. And she said to me just before the um before we we did the online Zoom session for the launch, she looked at me and she said, I kind of know that the book is about me, but I'm not going to tell anybody, but I kind of know. And I said, oh, that is so great. I'm so glad that you were able to come to that conclusion and validated her perspective. She thinks the book is about her. And, and that's absolutely great because it is about her and it is about each and every one of us having those experiences of learning from the people that we love and value in our lives that are sharing things with us, but also learning from that natural um, environment. Um, one of the things that I think is also important uh, to me about this work is that it's told in a first person voice um, in, and in an oral style. So it's actually meant not to be read, um, but to be read out. Um, and so I invite people to share this book. So it's not a children's book. It's a book that we would read together um, and, and then build on the ideas. So, um, yeah, I think this little, little piece has a life of its own. Um, and I'm really grateful to, how, uh, to Luke Swinson for bringing that, that life to it. I guess the, the thing that I would say about the two core ideas that I'm trying to, to express today about orality and images as being important Indigenous methodologies is that they can be an important starting point for future conversations. And I really love that you set up the conversation in reconciliation, understanding where we are not doing things because we have to, but because we understand that we should and want to um, as those starting points. And all of my work um, right now is reflecting back as I was putting slides together for you that don't work, but um, as I was putting them together, every single one of the books that I've published have an Indigenous uh, artist's imagery on the front of the book. And there's a story to just that book cover in and of itself that uh, is, is really important to understanding what's inside of that book. So those collaborations and those relationships are absolutely essential and they're what breathes life into um, works of art. And that's why um, that interdisciplinarity is important. It does mean for me working with people that have uh, sets of skills that, that I couldn't even imagine uh, having. Uh, I do want to share a couple other things other than the little book that I think are expressions of art that are important. This is the um, Nibé Declaration of Treaty 3. And 
the Women's Council and elders worked really hard on uh, putting together this declaration. It's a statement of Anishinaabe law relating to water. And they said that they wanted an image to represent the teachings that were in the declaration. So I approached a former law student of mine, Danielle Morrison, and uh, she's also a very talented Anishinaabe artist. And she took the declaration and the values, principles, teachings, and Anishinaabe law that are contained in it and put it into this image. What's interesting is that this image, I sat down with uh, Elder Alan White from Nuktiami Guaning, and he explained the image to me without reading the English text and captured everything that's in the declaration. So from the image, he was able to tell me everything that was in the written text. So to me, that was um, a complete example of how that image and that orality remains strong in Indigenous nations and is an important way of continuing to communicate, uh, for example, Anishinaabe law, which this is about, through those types of images. I also wanted to, um, to show you some images that uh, can be found on the Decolonizing Water website uh, that relate to a collaboration with performance and visual artist Casey Adams. Over the last uh, almost 10 years, we've been collaborating on um, traditional clay pottery and water and the interaction between the two. And it's been a really fruitful relationship that has had all kinds of manifestations and growth uh, within it. But I think the, the piece that to me is the, the most powerful part of that experience to date has been looking at the site where um, we gather for the annual Nibe gathering and where these performances are taking place and seeing that the turtles that are part of that work are actually laying their eggs there now. And we see their little egg hatches. We see that the land is responding to the work that's being done. And that's such a great way of thinking about the power of that expression of art and the spirit of art going beyond the human experience and actually engaging uh, the water, the land, um, the turtles as our non-human relatives. So thinking about these arts as ways of expressing important ideas beyond how humans can interact with those ideas, but thinking about how those ideas have an influence and are influenced by everything else that's part of our world. So that's what I wanted to um, share today. And again, I'm very grateful for the time. Looking forward to the discussion and, and questions. Miigwech. Thank you so much. Um, it's uh, I was sort of riveted as I read all of your works, but it's uh, a very different um, experience to hear you speak about it. And you know, thank you for the really thoughtful comments that you've made. I've got um, a couple of questions planned, but I'm I'm definitely going to open it up to questions, as I'm sure people have uh, comments or questions for you. Let me start with this. Uh, we hear a lot um, in popular culture today about the use of left and right sides of our brain. Um, and I think there's a general belief that as lawyers, we are analytical and we favor, you know, a logical or orderly approach. And I wonder whether you feel that you have to get into a different gear when you are doing artistic um, or creative work. Um, and Suzanne, I might ask you a follow-up question of, do you enjoy watching films anymore? Or are you sort of constantly in, in work mode as you, as you, uh, you know, do your analysis? Well, that's a fabulous question, the first and the second. Um, so just some background on me, I studied film, uh, film studies, and my PhD was um expressed through uh film uh, and uh, it was not on women in prison movies it was something it was something else it was run along the regulation of street involved and homeless people and my methodology chapter just to get to your question was called ambi um ambidextrous <laughs> i can't say the word in english ambidextrous yeah methodologies <laughs> So for me, there is no distinction. It's like I'm both and I am left-handed and right-handed and my brain works that way. I don't think 
uh, oh, I've got my cinema brain on now or my film studies brain or my feminist brain. Oh, no, I've got my law brain on because it's the same for me. And that makes it very confusing <laughs> and it makes it hard to be an expert and to speak with assurance about anything because I'm constantly second guessing. Um, but it means that there are layers and textures to my work that I feel that wouldn't exist if I were if I thought in terms of the left or the right. And in terms of films, 100%, absolutely, I adore watching good films. Uh, I've got a student here from my film class, and it's I feel that it's given me tools to read into the text or see things that I would not have been able to see otherwise. And as Amy was, as Professor Kraft was saying, like, uh, I can watch a film seven, eight, 20, 30 times. In fact, we watched a film in class together and I've seen it. It's called Hunt for the Wilder People. Fantastic Taika Waititi movie. Um, I cry every single time at the exact same spot. I know exactly what's going to happen. The music starts and I'm like, oh, it's going to get me. And then I ugly cry right in front of my students <laughs> every single time. Anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. Um, just the other day, uh, my partner and I just finished watching Yellowstone and I was really curious because I heard that it was written by one person, the screenplay for the entire series. Um, and he had said that he doesn't outline, he just kind of writes like a 10 hour movie. And then I was telling my partner, I'm like, that's so funny. I never thought about my writing processes, but as a lawyer and a legal scholar, I outline everything. You know, I have the headings, very organized. I think ahead and then I fill in the arguments and stuff like that. But when I write fiction, it is just, I just pants it basically. I just journal and it's completely different. So it is, it's a really different experience, but also kind of nice to be able to write differently, right? And to kind of <laughs> rebel against the the strictures of, of how we're taught in law school. And I kind of had to unlearn that a bit. But the one thing that I loved about being a, you know, what I've taken from being a lawyer and a you know, scholar is the discipline of writing, you know, as lawyers and as scholars, we write so much. Um, and just to not be afraid of the page, like that's what I think is amazing about our profession is that we end up writing so much that um, we're not afraid of making mistakes or trying out something new. And I've, I think the discipline that we learn here is really valuable for creativity, at least for, for me, it has been. Thanks. Great, great question. Um, I'm also ambidextrous. And when I talk about painting, I always use my left hand and I paint with my left hand. Um, and when I describe certain things, I'll use my left hand. But I don't know how that relates to right brain, left brain. But I guess the story that comes to mind is uh, I was an art intern mentor in a mentorship program in the late 90s. And I was voted by my colleagues as being, being the most likely to succeed as a professional artist. And then I met one of my colleagues, you know, 10, 15 years later, and he said to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm a lawyer. And he said, <laughs> what? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, and he, to, in his mind, it, those were completely separate things. And I think in everything that we do, it's honoring our own creative process. I don't outline. I hate outlining. I actually remember telling my mother in grade 11 language class that our teacher was forcing us to outline a story and that I didn't think it was a very good method for telling a story <laughs> and that I was refusing to do the, the work. And she said, can you please just do the work and pass the class? <laughs> um, but I had to learn to, to deal with that and actually writing a legal brief. I write a summary. I do a creative one page free flow and I end up poaching that language and inserting it everywhere into the structure of a factum later. So, you know, learning what is your, your best method and what brings out the best in you, I think is something that's really important. Um, that's probably antithetical to everything you're learning in law school, but, um, you know, I think that there is uh, a ability to, to think about what works um, best for you. Okay, I'll ask another question and then I promise to turn it over. Um, so as some of you know, I was a professional dance artist before I came to law school and I still choreograph and dance today. 
said, you know, about 15 years ago, I was taken aside by some senior colleagues and told, you know, it might be time to set aside this dance thing and really concentrate on law. <laughs> um, so my question for you is, are we in, do you think, more enlightened times where what is understood as law has really expanded? Um, and secondly, do you feel that it takes courage to work in the ways that you do outside of what we traditionally understood understand as mainstream law? And the order can change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, I'm sorry you had that experience um, because the binaries, I think, are we're shifting away from the binaries. I actually have students do artistic expressions as forms of evaluation for what they've learned in my classes. I tell them this is not a get out of jail free card. This is not going to be easier. It's probably going to be more difficult than writing a 20 page paper. And you're going to have to check in with me and, and we're going to have to work towards, you know, properly doing this as something that is uh, contributing to your grade. But um, I think, again, like anything else, it is about communication of ideas, and there isn't a set way of doing that. I think even now, um, as we look to legal education and knowledge mobilization, a lot of it's happening in different forms. Video has been something that's been really important to my practice and, and my, my research work. So um, I would encourage people to think in different ways and to use ways of expressing themselves that reflect the intent and purpose of their communication. Um, I think to this uh, elder and amazing storyteller named Louis Bird, who said stories are for thinking, which, you know, some might think that stories are meant to be consumed or that they tell you a response to a question. What he was saying is, you're not doing your job as someone who's listening to or telling a story if you're not using it as a means to engage in thought. So law is about thought. It's about argument. It's about telling a story. And so there's different ways of doing that. And, and I think there is more open space um, now. I'm glad you talked about your work because I think I would not have done this if I didn't see other people like you doing it before me no honestly like the fact that you were doing it so gracefully and so well and just watching you dance and interpret um law through your body was just eye-opening for me and it really inspired me to engage in my own work um you know I have to give kudos to someone like Tracy Lindbergh too who is also a novelist and was here teaching and I think um, when I saw her book come out, it really inspired me as well to start thinking about um, knowledge dissemination as much as I hate that word in different ways. Um, and I think, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but it really, I can't understate um, the fact that people literally have said to me, I didn't know statelessness exists. You know, th that kind of stuff is so powerful and for us to foreclose ways to express our ideas and um, to um, explore different ways of um, learning through it, because I think you're right, it's not just um, expounding, you know, my own views of things, but just giving a vehicle for other people to think these, these issues and these themes um, and encourage other people to do the same thing. So I think it is a, a great time, but I, I, I do want to say that I don't think this would have happened had I not seen people before me doing this. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Yeah, that's true. Um, I would just like add that um, I feel like the work that I do and that my, that we're doing, it's, it's not, um, I mean, it's hard work, right. And that, that you're doing, it's hard work and it's deep, deep thinking about law. And I think it's just, as I was saying about the films, it's just another tool in our toolbox. And I think maybe 25, 30 years ago, feminist scholars, critical race scholars were facing similar forms of um, really ignorant comments. Like, I, I'm sorry that that happened to you as well. And I just think it just shows the narrow mindedness or maybe the protectiveness of, to be fair to the, you know, a protectiveness, but also a narrow mindedness. I had the good fortune of having a PhD advisor who was like, you're not a dilettante, go and do this. You will not 
explain your film. Like he was very clear that the film was the thing, the artifact. I was gonna write an academic piece. I wrote a, a thesis as well, but at no point did I explain the art because it was standalone. Okay, are there questions from the audience that anyone has? Kind of like, I guess that's to like all of you, but these creative and kind of like non-traditional approaches, how do you find kind of the recognition and like legitimization within, you know, you know, like some, like the institution, like kind of like, let's say common law, where, you know, you kind of have more stringent and um, traditional approaches. Like, how do you make space for that? How do you make other people realize that it's as valid as other forms? Sure. I'll repeat the question in abbreviated form. Yeah. Um, um, so maybe non-traditional approaches, like these creative ways that, you know, with film, all these different avenues, how do we make sure that it's recognized as legitimate as traditional ways? Yeah. So the question is on the recognition and legitimization of this, these different types of, of expression. Um, I think in large part, some of us try and do both. And I'm going to say I'm not as good at acknowledging some of the work that I do as uh, part of my legal um, practice as I should be. So having conversations like this are actually really important, supporting our colleagues um, in, in their work and actually bringing this forward um, and having opportunities and spaces in which to have the conversations. That's part of why you see that mural that's outside on the third floor was as a space to engage in conversations, to have us thinking differently, to build something as a faculty. Like there are all these different pieces, but I still get the question, how is this about law? Um, and I think that having, having these conversations is incredibly important. Maybe my colleagues have other ideas? Um, in the area of research and teaching that I do in immigration law, a lot of um, stories get kind of missed in the case law. And so I think one of the most powerful things I've kind of come to and I'm trying to slowly start incorporating in my teaching is to bring in, um, you know, literary examples of what it's missing, right? Um, so for example, you know, one of the things I was thinking about recently was on um, Canadian cases that have made the factual finding that someone's not stateless. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking about this case about a Tibetan person and how the Federal Court of Appeal said this person's not stateless, they're actually a citizen of India, even though they India has never conferred citizenship on them, there's no indication that they would. Um, and there's this amazing novel out there right now that was uh, shortlisted for the Giller Prize called um, uh, We Are, oh, you know what, I don't want to screw up the title of the book, but it's by Sarin Yangsom Lama, and she's a Tibetan Canadian author. And there's excerpts in there that I will be using to teach alongside this course to, this case to show, to, to kind of disrupt the factual findings in the law and to show that there's other pieces of um, lived experience that are missing from legal um, judgment from legal reasoning. Um, so these are things that I'm slowly starting to come to, but I feel like there's a, like, you know, I'm at the beginning of this kind of journey. And I think there's a lot more work that can be done in this regard. And yeah, I'd be open to hearing how other people are thinking through it and, and working through that as well. Thank you. Um, I guess it's just a little story. So the most uh, rewarding research experience I've ever had in law it is a collaboration that I have been doing because it's been put on pause since the pandemic, but uh, at the mission where I go in with a colleague and a former student and we teach folks how to use Powtoons, which is a free online software that lets you create short animated films. And it's a filmmaking workshop where folks will learn how to make a movie and at the end of the, at the end of the two day thing they've created a film to text right because i'm a law professor they are always trying to tell what they want they think i want to hear 
like the law stories that they think I want to hear, which is fascinating. And the other thing is that, I mean, even without that drive, their stories are about regulation, about exclusion, about marginalization. They're about law. Um, but just a funny thing, I, I keep encountering one guy who um, who is in the workshop with me, and he says to me, because we do a, a screening here at the law faculty, and they can bring, they can invite friends and families, and we show their short films, and we have popcorn, and I give them a diploma uh, or a certificate that um, that is done here. And the guy that his name is George, he sees me, and he's like, "Hey, prof, I've got my law degree in my backpack." Like he just carries it around. It's a, and it's fantastic. And um, the point is that I've done absolutely nothing that from a scholarly standpoint or from a concrete legal research standpoint or anything to advance the law, but would I not do it? Absolutely not. It, was, it is the most rewarding. And I constantly learn in my interactions with, with the participants and it makes me a better teacher. It makes me a better person, I think. Um, and ultimately, and this is gonna seem very flip, <laughs> but I don't know that I care that I'm on the margins of the law faculty. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think some of my scholarship is at the margins and I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm okay that it may not be perceived as relevant to somebody that I may not otherwise be having a conversation with. Sorry. That's, <laughs> That's okay to say. It reminds me of that saying, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. <laughs> Any other questions? Just want to see if anybody has one. Oh yes, there's a few. I'm going to pass you the mic. I don't. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, kind of a perfect segue from for my question. Uh, do you see a future where you personally would use arts education in all of your classes? I know you all teach multiple different classes that are not just on immigration or film. Um, so I'm wondering if you see a future where you could use arts education in every different class that you uh, teach and if there's any pushback. And if there's any pushback, how would you deal with that? Full disclosure, I'm kind of writing a paper on this, so I would love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Uh, I already, I already do. Uh, so, like, I teach a social justice class. It's called social justice. It's not called film in the law. It's a social justice class. I teach through film. Uh, the text. Is it? It's, it's okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, the text. The text that we engage with our film. Uh, in my uh, first year alternative dispute resolution class, I use YouTube uh, regularly. Uh, from sometimes I get films uh, students to watch films. When I used to teach feminist uh, uh, legal theory, I would have students also engage in uh, artistic expressions of of uh, a critique of a judgment. And I got a student who submitted a recipe here, and she, it was like a cookie thing. It was very layered and interesting. I've had collages, and then so I guess briefly, I already do it. I have I had any pushback. Um, not, not that I know of, like not explicitly, uh, never have I been challenged. I mean, I think in first year, the students are maybe a little bit less patient with that kind of stuff, but a minority of students, most of them enjoy having the opportunity to use this legal thinking skills that they have and to expand beyond that and to apply that thinking to real world situations. I think I have to admit that I'm a bit of a latecomer to this practice, but it, during the pandemic, in a bid to try to reduce like on screen time, um, part of uh, the evaluation was to review a novel, a film, a poem, anything, a, a painting that had anything to do with migration or immigration. Um, and there were some amazing reviews and it was it became kind of a, a thing in the classroom where people would start recommending things to other students and it was really rewarding to hear what people could um, unearth and how they tied it to the class's themes and so I never received pushback but more it was kind of an exciting um, discussion starter that people would engage in and I thought it created more opportunities for 
actually having very rich discussions about the class material. Um, so yeah, no, no pushback as of yet, but um, in fact, more amazing and rich discussion. There are two spaces of intervention for artistic expression. One is um, what we use as teaching material um, and definitely do a lot of that um, film, videos, uh, literature. Uh, I also have um, student-led seminars where they're encouraged to think of different ways of setting the stage for a fruitful discussion. So I've had uh, music playing in the background um, and, you know, poetry read, um, actual physical manual art practice. Um, and so I think those are are important. I, I think there's also the art creation piece, uh, as Professor Abouklein was, was mentioning, that can be a really important way of uh, evaluating how information has been received and communicating ideas. And so I think all of that is really powerful in terms of how uh, we uh, share material, but also how we receive communication back from students in their expressions. Uh, I have to say this year, um, Professor Anne Veik and I have been doing a pilot on the, in the French program for the first year mandatory course on reconciliation and decolonization. And our students, first year students had been in law school 1.2 days, <laughs> went out and made videos at different sites of reconciliation and decolonization. They were some of the most amazing law student products I've ever seen. And many of them would have said, we don't know anything about the law, but they took that opportunity to really dive in and then express themselves in that way. And it was very rich in terms of experience for them, but also for us. And I think those who will watch their videos in the future. Just wonder if a question to you. Would you like to answer that? <laughs> um, I'm like, am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> um, I also um, use uh, in law more in terms of uh, teaching materials. Um, and I haven't sort of fully engaged with um, having students. Uh, you know, offer in art as um, as possible assignment material. Um, and that's partly been because I um, have trouble putting a grade on um, something like that. Uh, but I'm, I'm certainly open and inspired by uh, hearing what all of you have been saying. And I'll probably uh, pick your brains about uh, how to do that in a way that feels, um, you know, sort of ethical and, and in line with, um, you know, what we want to do in terms of art promotion. Um, so that would be my response. I see that there's one other question. We also have one question from uh, the online version. Okay, perfect. Um, I don't know if this is on, but I feel like people can probably hear me. Just if you're online, they can't hear you oh. unless you use the microphone. I think it's on. It, can you hear? Like, I don't think that's on. A little sure. green light? Yeah. Um, I don't know if both of them can be turned on at the same time, so maybe then you can bring yours on. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this question is uh, very connected to the first two questions, but it's also, it's mostly for Professor Kraft. Um, so we, in Professor Bach's Woman Religion in the Law class, we spent um, one week, we read and discussed about like beauty and aestheticism in Indigenous law and the legal principles um, that are embedded. And uh, our classmate, v Vina, who's here, presented on an article called Beautiful Creeness. Um, and I'm still, I'm, I feel like I have a lot of work to do in terms of just wrapping my head around those concepts. And, um, I'm just wondering, um, whether, because the cases that we've read for the most part, I've just seen common law judges, um, sort of reject, um, evidence or testimony that is based in that sort of aestheticism. I'm thinking about like in Delgamuk and BC, um, uh, an indigenous woman tried to sing as part of a testimony and the judge said, I, I have a tin ear, I can't hear you when you sing to me or something like that. So, I mean, I'm just wondering, Professor Kraft, if if you have read any cases where you perceived um, like inroads have been made, um, if you if, if you think, um, yeah, just, just what your thoughts are on um, sort of, 
the common law beginning to recognize really these different ways of telling stories and communicating. Would you just turn your microphone off now? That's a great question. And I think that that's a challenge that's inherent in the law is understanding form different forms of evidence, right? And evolving how we see things as evidence and then how we interpret them to have legal meaning. And there's quite a few people that have been working on this for a long time, but one of the spaces in which we had a significant am a amount of debate um, was actually in a project with the federal court on the federal court guidelines on oral history and elders evidence to ex address exactly some of the things that you're raising. How do you bring something that doesn't fit into uh, a courtroom uh, and have it validated the, and how do you not bring it in, have it seen, but not given any value or weight, right? In a, in a legal context. And those are really challenging questions because there's so much discretion built into the decision-making role uh, of judges. And so one of the, um, I think the, the challenge um, or the things that we need to think about is who are legitimate decision-makers? What is the proper forum? Um, who has jurisdiction over certain decisions and where do we need to place deference? And those are going to be case by case um, decisions that are made. When I was practicing early on in my career, I was told by elders, this should not go into a courtroom. And they were very clear about certain things that should never be in a court space. Um, I think to recently in the Restul case where they did really interesting work about bringing some of the Indigenous knowledges into the courtroom, but having things that were off the record that were done uh, outside of the courtroom space, but that were part of Indigenous law. And it, it was kind of a mutual nod to, okay, this is the protocol of this Western courtroom, but we're also going to do Anishinaabe law right alongside in this different space and not bring it in, but it's going to exist in its own parallel space, similarly to the two row um, philosophy. Is there uh, a way of doing it right? Uh, I don't think we've achieved that yet. Um, and I think we really need to think about how we build up decision-making spaces, Indigenous decision-making spaces, not only incorporating Indigenous knowledge into Western process, but rethinking the process and the values by which certain things are decided. Want to add to that? You want to add? Um, I think we have, we don't have much time left, but I see that there's a question online. Um, so, Michael, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone, um, and thanks. I'm sorry I'm late to the um, to the event, so you may have already addressed this, but I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, I was wondering, and and it kind of builds a little bit on some of what Professor Kraft was talking about. Uh, I was thinking about Diane Millian's work felt and on felt theory and and the role of emotions. And I just wondered if anyone um, had anything to say about how your engagements with art have transformed the way you think about law and emotion. I mean, there are all kinds of ideas about what constitutes evidence and reason and that kind of thing. I'm not a lawyer, but um, I'm just curious to hear anyone who would have anything to say in that regard, but thank you. Oh, just really quickly. Hi, Michael. Um, uh, Hello. Really quickly, one of the things that film does is it puts you in the space of either like where, depending on how the camera is angled, you are, you may be in this, your position to feel injustice in a way that reading a case about sexual assault, especially as Professor Liu is saying, when the facts have been stripped and the people who have been impacted by an act are removed. Um, film allows you to experience that injustice in a very powerful and visceral way. Yeah, really quickly. I think this is the reason why I wrote this book because I, I wanted to explore emotion primarily. And I think, you know, a lot of people <laughs> for better or for worse, you know, would write me and be like, I cried so much reading it. I'm like, I'm sorry, but also I'm not sorry. You know, <laughs> like that was whole point was to have people feel things that they couldn't feel in my other writings. So yeah, I think there, there has, 
you know, this discussion has been really rich because I'm like, how do we incorporate that more in the, the legal venues more? Like, you know, I've done it kind of as a rebellious kind of act of writing this, but in, but, you know, to the questioner's point about like, how do we bring that back into our legal venues is a good one and one that I'm still thinking about. Same. I continue to think about it. Um, right now I'm preparing a land-based course and I was trying to figure out how do we capture the emotion of these cases, many Supreme Court cases within Treaty 3 territory. And the conclusion that I came to was, let's have the land tell us the story. Let's design the syllabus around the land itself. And what story, if it could speak, what story would it tell us? We're still going to study Supreme Court of Canada cases. We're still going to, um, you know, talk about facts, but we're going to be on land and have an emotive experience. And hopefully that's a different way of learning and thinking about it and, and seeing the story behind the story. Law is not just the case. It's what happened before and it's what happens after. And often we forget that in our legal learning environments. And, and I would urge everybody, um, like my colleagues do here, to think about, you know, what comes before, what comes after, and what's all around. Thank you so much. Uh, please join me in thanking this incredible group of women scholars. Um, and to everyone here, please take food on your way out. Thank you so much for joining us.